Hello everyone, uh, my name is Peter Blundell and I'm here with my colleague and friend Sheila Hoare um, and today this is a therapist uh, reflecting video where we're going to be having a bit of a discussion around unconditional positive regard. We're not really sure where it's going to uh, go uh, but um, Sheila do you want to tell people why we, we, we decided to talk about this today? Yes, yes I am. Um... I've been um, thinking about unconditional positive regard. I realize in quite a lot of different guises over the last couple of years. And uh, for one reason or another, Peter and I were talking and I came to understand this, this possibility of this forum and just thought it would be really nice to uh, spend a little time, me sort of like banging on about my ideas about it but actually having a discussion with somebody about it rather than, you know, I can sit on my own and bang on about this till the cows come home or pontificate. Um, so when Peter was talking about this this this, this forum, um, we said, well, well, why don't we have a chat about it? I would really, really welcome that. It gets helps my thinking. I know you're interested in it, Peter. So it just seemed like a nice idea. Yeah, I'm quite excited to see where it goes um, <laughs> and what, what it is that we talk about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, because we're going quite free flowing here, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Which is <laughs> exciting, but quite nerve wracking as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can start us off, though, mm -hmm. with the, um, you know, the, well, I don't know if it's the abstract or the, uh, the proposal uh, or just a thought for me, really, um, is... Uh, about this idea, which I, you know, when we started talking, I was saying to you that, that this sense that um, this condition, one of the, the six conditions of Roger's work and one of the five um, therapist conditions is basically now being, is, 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 has been reduced to an acronym, UPR. I mean, we, we were talking uh, just before we started, uh, what do we call this discussion simply because we don't well I don't want us to call it I don't even want us to call it unconditional positive regard anymore which is partly what this what we're going to be talking about so it's the sort of the idea of trying to reclaim what the acronym UPR is supposed to stand for but whether we've lost we've lost the feeling in it is really where this has started, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, so that idea that it's kind of thrown out there, oh, UPR, we offer UPR, do all therapists offer UPR, but actually, mm -hmm. what does that actually mean in practice? And is it yeah. is it is it actually a one thing that yeah. we all do, or is that something different that's created mm -hmm. with each person that we meet? Mm -hmm. And then that, that whole area of is whatever we're talking about today even possible? Is it because some people have suggested it's not possible? Uh, and whether that for me, my question about that is if, um, if we really have a clarity about what we mean, then I'm happy to discuss that. But quite often I feel like people say, oh, UPR is not possible uh, because, you know, I just don't like some people. I mean, I'm exaggerating for clarity, but that's in essence what we're doing. So that's how we've got here. Mm. So the next bit would be the difference the difference, and I, I'm, uh, I rely on Roger's 1959 paper quite a bit in terms of uh, a clarity of how he described person-centered client, as it was called, he called it in that paper, client-centered psychotherapy. Um, but that paper is, uh, is a little bit sort of, it's, it's quite a cold paper. You know, he, he was asked to write it for, in a particular format for a particular um, very prestigious publication at the time. So it's in a certain format. Um, and when you read other bits of Roger's work, I think what we might be discussing today is absolutely, it's all in his work already. So I don't think we're talking about anything new. I do think we might be talking about something that was lost and trying to bring it back in. Uh, and for me, that's the words around uh, uh, love, compassion, kindness, caring, 
uh, that someone knows that they matter to me in some way. Um, they're, they're the words that are being concertinaed into UPR. And is that a big enough acronym for all of that? <laughs> um, I'm thinking, and, and, and I suppose I'm wondering actually, does this often happen with all acronyms, yeah. <laughs> no matter what you're, what you're using them for? Yeah, yeah. Is this quick offhand idea yeah. of representing something, yes. but actually isn't something lost in that abbreviation? Uh, I mean, maybe even in the word, the three words it's, itself, but but then yeah. to reduce yeah. it down to three letters, as if we're all talking about the same thing. Oh, you're so right, actually. It's uh, and isn't that interesting because there are certain acronyms that I see have developed over the years in writing and I write, react. So capital C, small O, w, capital W for conditions of worth. And, and nobody thinks twice. And I'm like, no, 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 that's it's a, not an acronym. I'd not, I'd not link that. You, yes, you're right. Um, and not only with us, of course, it's, it's the same. It's the same. Yeah. So, yeah, there is something. Language is so important. Um, and I know, you know, this is this is around for us all at the moment, isn't it? About how we use language. Are we just being woke, for example? You know, 20 years ago, you people were being uh, accused of just being politically correct. Um, now it's that or you're not woke enough. Um, and, and all the, the bits of truth in all that for me is these words do do matter, really do matter, uh, not least when I think about, uh, you know, compassion and warmth, there's something there also about thinking about where that, where the definition of what constitutes warmth and com compassion mm. comes from. You know, so we move into a little bit of how psychology is such, psychology as most of us know it, is such a white Western description mm. of what is, normal what is healthy what is um what's the word what's pre preferred um and this concept falls into that as well can fall into that trap just as easily just as easily i don't know if that's if you get can sort of like join in with that one peter i guess no yes i was i suppose what i was i may be going off on a little bit of a different angle but i was thinking about putting the word unconditional in front of compassionate Unconditional, oh. unconditional compassion, or compassion, really? unconditional compassion. Well, you know, maybe might be the phrase I was thinking of when you were talking. Yeah, yeah. And I was thinking, is that the same? Is that different from unconditional positive regard? Is it an element of unconditional positive regard? Um, yeah, I, I did get into a linguistic tangle recently that when I was looking at the uh, research around, um, I keep calling it this concept because I don't want to call it you <laughs> are, but <laughs> saying warmth, love and compassion, warmth and understanding, there's a song in that somewhere as well. Um, there's also probably another acronym we could call <laughs> it. <laughs> Unconditional <laughs> UCR. <laughs> um, but in the in a lot of the research, in most of the research recently, the word unconditional has been dropped and they just talk about positive regard. And at first I was sort of a bit railing against that. It's like, no, the unconditionality is really, really important. But actually I think, and I'm checking out if this would be your understanding, if it's called, if it's called positive regard, that means positive regard for everything all the time. So you don't need to have the unconditional in there, do you? I suppose it's whether you think about it as a as an overarching or mm -hmm. whether it is a at the moment I have positive regard for you, but that's mm -hmm. not always the case. Uh-huh. Is it something that we have or something that is there? Oh, that's very profound, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> it just came out. It wasn't yeah, thought yeah. through that way. I have or something that's there. Mm -hmm. Something that's... It's very much... I mean, Liata wrote about unconditionality 
being for the the unconditionality part was for the deeper core of the person mm. and what they could become um which neatly i, I don't mean this um pejoratively but that neatly sidesteps the worry about you know behavior all those sorts of things it's about the potentiality so the positive regard is for all of those aspects of self that that are there that have not been seen or shown yes or have not yeah. emerged or, or, or not emerged. Yeah, yeah something yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. I, I i've i've sometimes thought about it um in terms of but basically, I mean, it's another, all these words can be very trite if, you, if you're not careful with them, but like that absolute profound respect for this other human being trying to make their way in this world, for me, is about that. Is that that's the unconditional. I mean, I'm thinking now, as I say that, I'm not sure I can even separate, separate out unconditional positive regard. It's just, a, it's a warmth and compassion I mean, I'm glad you said that because I, as you were talking about like that word respect, I was, I was, I couldn't, I couldn't get there in terms of mm -hmm. the phrase. Mm -hmm. I just kept feeling the feeling, yes. of the warmth and the, I suppose you mentioned it before, love, yes, um, for someone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, an embodied yeah. feeling. And, and and some of these words are words that somewhere along the line got expunged from therapy. Uh, they were dangerous. They were, uh, in some in some approaches, would be described as over identification or uh, what's the other word when you get overwhelmed by someone? Something like that. You get, you know, it's like it gets too close to you. Uh, and I think people sometimes have used the example um, Rogers, you know, according to the biography, Rogers, uh, he worked with a client that he found very, very challenging uh, and got so close to them that one afternoon, it, I mean, emotionally and therapeutically, um, and one afternoon just decided, just decided they couldn't, he couldn't do it anymore. And handed over to John Schlein saying, I can't manage, you know, that afternoon. Um, there's, a, there's a word in uh, psychodynamic word. Oh, God. Anyway, it's gone. It'll come. It'll come. Um, and I realize as we're talking, I'm slowing down and uh, starting to sink into it. And I, I think that's th that's probably the very... I think that's what I caught while I've been sort of trying to look around and researching UPR and, and tables and stuff like that. And so I get caught up a, a little bit in the, the sort of the research protocols around for these things, which in some ways I know are necessary, but it becomes so heady. It becomes so heady. And then to actually say, do you know what? I really care about my clients. It's like, oh, be careful. You'll never identify, you'll get swept away. And we feel that fear. I mean, if we're told it's a, I think for some of us, I shouldn't say everybody. If uh, I shouldn't say it, but I do. <laughs> um, that if we're told we're going to get swept away, if we're told we're over identifying, if we're told it's wrong to feel this, then we start to think it is wrong. And then those moments of when I think, am I going to get compassion fatigue? I mean, that that is the other side. If I care like this. I suppose I was wondering, where am I going to get swept away to? Uh-huh. So for you, there's no sense of getting swept away somewhere. I mean, the sense of swept away for me sounds and feels like this uncontrollable mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. of, of, of going somewhere that I shouldn't I shouldn't be yeah. going yeah yeah for me when I'm thinking about the feeling there's a stillness to it yeah for me. yeah 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 and I come back to the idea of oh, I don't know if we have discussed this but the idea of presence mm -hmm. like it's mm -hmm. very much attached to that for me part of my presence and stillness as I'm with somebody 
Yes. So I don't think I've ever, I don't think I've felt ever a risk of being swept away. No, I, I felt I felt in danger of my stuff. You know, I, I was talking the other day with some people about that grief that sometimes comes up, and it's like the wobbling of my chin or the that, and it's so it's so clearly mine that. that um, is coming up for me as someone's talking. And I don't know if it's ever happened to you, but in some grief moments, strange phrase, but in some moments, like that sense of I start crying, I will never, ever mm -hmm. stop. And I, I know this isn't true now. Your your body physically can't cry forever. <laughs> um, but that moment, and maybe that's what people, that's the sort of moment people are thinking about. But I don't think that's actually, as you're talking, I don't think that's about compassion actually that's that's some that's something else i'm getting caught up in rather than my feeling toward this person and that i have had that feeling mm -hmm. and i can imagine that sweeping me away but i almost feel that that might sweep me away away from not away from my compassion but away from my stillness in the in the in the moment with the client yeah away from my focus in some way yeah 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 into my own frame of reference yes 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 exactly so sort of that's got nothing to do with this bit <laughs> well it by exploring it and knowing yeah. it it helps, to, <laughs> it absolutely. helps to. no yeah yeah i i also the other thing um as you know i i live in um, chechia and it's a it's a central eastern european country it's very like ours uh, and the, but the point of saying all that is the different ways that compassion or caring is shown mm. um so i I think this could these I just think sometimes I, I feel like these are so trite, but they're so meaningful for me. Um, you know, for me, one of the ways of showing something like that that I I have compassion for however you walk through the door, <laughs> it's like that's okay with me. Um, and one of my ways, it's like because I guess partly because I'm a Brit, even though I offer a cup of tea. You know, would you like? And I know that some people are quite still can be quite surprised at a therapist offering. I don't actually offer tea usually in Prague. It's it's a coffee. Um, some some people. I won't go into the minute tie of this, <laughs> um, but that sort of sense of uh, welcoming, I think, is part of this. It's about kindness and warmth is it indicating well i think it's indicating i care about you yeah. and i'm interested in you being comfortable yeah. whilst you're here yeah there's a really nice paper from somebody who is very i, I can't i think he's kleinian or very winnicottian very psychoanalytical in my view a guy called brett carr not so long well not so long ago it could be 10 years ago actually <laughs> recently um, in the living past, he did a paper uh, called, it was a short paper called something like, uh, don't spill your red wine on my carpet. And basically his scenario was, I can't remember if it was real or not. I think it might have been real um, or he was, you know, imagine, anyway, point being, you know, people are invited to this really nice party, this soiree, supper. That people have I've never been to a soiree myself but you know it sounds nice and um you know the the nice food is out and we're all very civilized and everybody's chatting and you come in and you get offered uh, a nice red wine or a white wine i don't think beer was on the agenda in, that, in this scenario um i think i'm catching some maybe class issues here but the point being um that um the guests they get their white wine and all the rest of it, and they're given the red wine, and it's like, be careful not to spoil, not to drop uh, any red wine on the carpet, this, you know, this beautiful white carpet, which is new. And that's been the instruction, be careful not to drop any white red wine. And just the knock-on effects of that, because then people are starting to be a bit, a bit nervous about um, 
you know, dropping their wine. So they're not relaxed. So the question being, why would you invite someone into your home and give them red wine and tell them not to drop it? So the warmth and the and he was basically the point he was making was how as therapists do we invite people into what is our and all the power that's involved in that? How do we invite people into our space, be it in a in an office that we're hired or in our home office or in our home, um, in somewhere in our home? How do we invite people in in a way that is warm and welcoming and creates a space where somebody feels accepted? You know, so, uh, you know, me and my gla a glass of wine, it, it's not my environment so much. And then I then have to be careful. I feel like I'm tend towards a slightly clumsy person. You know, I would have one glass of wine and probably go home because I'd be too scared of dropping red wine on the carpet. Um, that makes me think about the conditions, the mm -hmm. six necessary sufficient conditions. And, and in that example, how the conditions were created to make it not a safe space. <laughs> safe space yeah and yeah. that by putting that in the person was trying to make it a safe space for them the person who owned the property and, and yeah. was in the, having the party yes. but it wasn't then necessarily a safe space for the guests who were being served the wine oh peter that is that really takes me off on that so is um, I, I don't know what I don't, um, when Pete when a new client comes in if you're someone I pose this to us and others when somebody comes in and you've got your contract or your agreements or they've had to sign or they've got to say yes I've read it on the internet I mean I'm not saying we shouldn't do it I don't do it I'm not saying people shouldn't do it but actually what, what's the welcome notice on the door My uh, first experience, and um, I've said in previous places, I think I said it in the last time we met for one of these sorts of things, my life achievement one, <laughs> was um, about my experience with psychodynamic mm -hmm. and how I loved the theory and it all fell apart in the third seminar semester in terms of practice. And the part of that was... Um, and, it, you know, it's going, well, it's, oh, it's 20 years ago, geez. I was going to say it's not going back that far. Um, but uh, we had to go to the analyst's home for, there was, I think we were in a group of eight for supervision. And it was up in Hampstead. It was in the same uh, road as where Freud lived. It's a very, very um, wealthy part of uh, that part of London. And I was a bit overawed by that. Um, and uh, I got to the house and I knocked on the door and I said, I've come for the supervision. And the guy said, oh, you need to go around the side, to the office around the side. And I, I just felt, I felt so many things in that moment. You know, when you have these moments where it it'll take me an, a day to tell you what I thought <laughs> in that moment. But it was something about I was not good enough to go into the house. Now, I know this all fits within the paradigms, the different paradigms. It makes sense within um, psychoanalysis, for example. But I really just went into a bit of a place of, oh, okay, I, I, I can't, I'm not good enough to go around here. And I had to walk around and go into this side office. And that for me, I guess that's why Brett Carr's paper, thinking about it now, so stuck with me, was that that was not a welcoming, that was not a welcome mat. Um, that was, a, that reminded me of the old thing of it was years ago, I think some people still have it, the tradesman's entrance, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. You know, but it was called the therapist entrance, but it's still, you know, you weren't good enough. No, I get it. I mean, if that put eight people tramping through your house might not be the ideal, actually. But it still didn't feel welcoming. People on your carpet with red wine. But do you know what I mean? Yeah, it uh, uh, makes me think about the physical space and different therapists that I've uh, visited. And um, for me, when I'm talking to students, I talk about how the therapeutic relationship is starting. 
the yes. moment there is any form of yes. of, 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 of contact and yeah. um, two um, uh, situations come to mind one time when I was going to see a therapist and and I appreciate I don't no judgment really <laughs> against the therapist but the kids bikes were kind of strewn in the hallway and there was and I had to climb over climb, <laughs> climb over things to kind of get into the into the building mm -hmm. and I appreciate you know they would have had a busy day and not managed to move it or whatever but it's for the first time yeah, yeah. seeing somebody yeah. feeling a bit nervous not sure what they're going to be like what this is going to be like to navigate through that yes um yeah. was was just added like another another a, another another layer for me as a as a as a, as a client um it can swing I, too far the other way you're saying in some yeah, way actually yeah 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the, well i suppose what i'm thinking about is the the conditions are important to in creating a say in creating a safe and relaxed and welcoming space like yes. it can be yes. unwelcoming for people for lots of different reasons by putting in rigid contractual boundaries from the offset or by I know not but all by not <laughs> having I, anything I, there you know I mean I know we're talking about um compassion and warmth positive regard um but that brings me to that place where you 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 can't I I don't think it works talking about them completely separate of course mm -hmm. um because there for me you're talking about empathy as well it's like you know actually how is someone going to feel yeah. climbing over those bikes yeah um now it might have been absolutely unavoidable so this is I, i'm with you it's not a criticism no. it's an observation mm -hmm. that actually that did impact you yeah. in terms of that relationship and who knows how it would have been different if those bikes hadn't been there yeah yeah mm -hmm. and and that that begins as soon as we start to have any kind of Absolutely. contact with a, with a, with a, with a client. But Bozoth had quite a nice flow. Um, and it was about for Bozoth, um, what he, in his writings, what he described as UPR um, um, when he was writing theoretically. But so let's say warmth and compassion where the curative that that's the curative factor in person-centered therapy for him and empathy is the way it is uh communicate or empathic responses or bob Bodley's empathic following responses that's the way it's communicated by the congruent therapist and, I, and there's, there's something i quite like about that um that idea although as well it, it separates things out mm. rather a lot um, but there's something that appeals to me in that it's it's I think it's the logic that if we're arguing or with you know our hypothesis is that it's conditions of worth that cause our griefs um, and they are caused because we get conditional love, then it, it sort of makes a logical sense that if you're getting an unconditional love, then we'll get better. I mean, that's that. Um, so I, that something appeals to me, although maybe it's a bit too simple. That's what, that's what, that's what I'm thinking about is that unconditional love or compassion creates a safe space yeah. for someone to explore all those mm. other things mm. um, that are maybe more difficult to mm. um, talk about. Yeah, yeah. So if that's where the healing bit comes in for me is by creating that space, there's room for those other things to be explored. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's us. I mean, it's really, it's really simple, isn't it? If if I'm loved for who I am, then the bits of me that I don't love can still come here and be loved. Yeah. Oh God, this sounds nice, doesn't it? It does. And Sheila, we're like coming up to half an hour. Blind. Which is this what we agreed we were, we were going to talk for? Okay. But, but I also feel like we could have um, carried up, just carried on with this discussion um, yeah. for, a lot, for a lot longer but for me the, the, I, 
it's a it's a start of course because there's something um because there's another bit about uh, how the next bit for me would be how do we risk this love there feels like there's a risk somewhere in this i'm not i haven't quite caught i can catch some of my own fear i think i can catch some of our fear out my fear out there but so i don't know if it's all about fear but something there's a next there's a next bit here it is we seem to be agreeing and i hazard more people agree you know let's talk about love you know that you and i both liver puddlings we've got a history of all you need is love and it's whatever it's true and i remember the loving awareness campaign on the continent at one point um so something about what's dangerous about it starting well, it, to that i wonder whether again because we 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 started off this discussion kind of saying do we actually know what unconditional positive regard is mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. now i'm thinking do we know what love is? Yes. And and yes. by that I mean, I was having this conversation with some students yesterday. I I I can be offering or providing or, or having a sense of love in in a session with a client, mm -hmm. but it may be a certain type of yeah 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 love. And the danger element I think is when people misconstrue maybe what I'm saying now with yeah yeah romantic romantic sexual, sexual love. Mm -hmm. yeah that's not yeah. that's not what i'm talking about yeah you know? yeah absolutely um, and maybe that's when people feel more comfortable with the words compassion mm -hmm. say for example but for me they're they're, yeah. con they're connected in, yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in some way you know I'm, I'm tempted to go and have a look at the work some of the work i can't i don't know if there's anything specific but peter schmidt on what does compassion mean what where did the come from you know the the wording come from um yeah i think there's a next bit to this maybe i hadn't realized there might be an, part, part two yeah part two part two yeah. nice one thanks Sheila. we'll leave it there for today yeah yeah okay <laughs> we'd love to hear what everyone thinks in the comments thanks everyone thank you